In today's video, we return to the notion of essentialism by looking at one of its prime forms. You've probably heard it said that identity is everything, but as a scholar of religion, you know there's way more that goes into this notion of identity, and we are going to unpack that and deconstruct that in this video, and that's coming up right now. As scholars of religion, we are well aware that human beings essentialize each and every day. By essentialism, we mean the way that people take the complexities of the world around them and distill them into singular elements. When we like essentialism, when essentialism works in our favor, we often describe the world in terms of its roots, its nature, its singular qualities, its core. When we talk about essentialism in terms of ways that are not favorable to our own position, we often, often talk about caricatures and stereotypes, exaggerations, hyperboles. But as scholars of religion, edict outsiders making sense and observing the way that people make meaning in the world, we know that these are six of one, half a dozen of the other. They're two sides of the same coin. That essentialism abbreviates complexities rather than illustrating or elaborating on them. As scholars of religion, that's precisely what we're trying to do. We are trying to elaborate on the complexities of the universe and the people within it. So when we approach people who are essentializing, when we observe them referring to rhetoric or words to make worlds that are going to distill things into singular elements, we've got to unpack that. We've got to deconstruct that. We've got to ask about the function that's going on in those processes. Craig Martin gives us a four-part model to do precisely that. As scholars of religion, we know that people use words to make worlds and that these words often simplify or essentialize the things that they are constructing. Martin says that these classifications that make the world go round often are hiding the differences that we intend to make that work for our benefit and sometimes work against others. In other words, Martin wants us to look at the projected, hidden, essence that goes on when we are classifying the world into essentials. So think about projection in terms of like a movie theater and the way that we project film onto a screen and you see the screen and you just say, oh, I'm watching a video, I'm watching a film. But you know that there's a whole process, a whole mechanical or digital process going on, even though we are just appreciating the thing that's on the screen. We do this with the world around us all the time. As we use our words to make worlds, we are obscuring the processes that go into that. And as scholars of religion, it's our job to deconstruct what Martin calls part two of his model, and that is the labels. It is our job to deconstruct the labels being used in the world around us. If words make worlds, we know better than to believe that sticks and stones may break our bones, but words may never hurt us. Words can hurt us, and they can help us, they can harm us, and they can heal us. Words do all sorts of things. And Martin says we've got to look for the way that people deploy their labels because there are things that are hidden behind those labels, and there's a lot more that we attach to those labels. For the latter, he talks about this in terms of their additional characteristics. That we use labels all the time, but there are often other things that go with these labels. We add on other characteristics. And when we understand the full weight of the descriptions that we use to identify other people and other things and make sense of the world, we begin to understand their social role. There we go, their social role. So the four things that Martin wants us to look for when we are deconstructing essences are the projected hidden essence, the label, the additional characteristics that go with that, and their social role. Now, I'm going to use an example. Um, it's going to probably catch you as strange. Um, I'm going to leave an example from the history of religions to Martin. He's going to talk about the Bhagavad Gita from Hinduism and the way that um, ancient, uh, this ancient Hindu text identifies different people into specific castes or classes. 
I'm going to use an example outside of the history of religion that uses the same dynamics so that we can hone in on the way that essentialism really is uh, an abbreviation for a larger process. I'm going to talk about milk. Now, we think we know what milk is, right? But I'm going to say there's way more to milk than we often think. There's more than meets the eye when it comes to milk. I'm going to show you how. So I'm going to use milk as the projected hidden essence. Um, so think about milk in your mind, right? You're in the grocery store, you're walking down the aisle, you're moving down the aisle, and you get to the milk section. Some stores are going to call it, right, the dairy section. Now you may see where I'm going with this, right? Um, dairy, right? Dairy products are going to see the gallons of milk. I bet that's what you had in your mind. And when you think about all that goes into the stuff in the dairy section and goes into milk, right? What do you think of? You're probably thinking of a cow, right? These are just additional characteristics, right? Even at the store, you might even see pictures of this stuff, let alone other products. So you see a cow or animals, you see, um, right, uh, natural ingredients, um, right? There's, there's all sorts of uh, good nutrients, right, that are in milk. If you're like me as a kid, you probably heard of all the ways that milk does the body good. That was the ad campaign for the dairy lobby, that milk does the body good when I was a kid. Um, and so milk is an important part of a balanced breakfast, right? Because we can use milk on food, we can use it in our baking, we can drink it. There's all sorts of stuff that we can use with milk. And it has all these characteristics, right? This is what goes into or is part of um, the dairy milk that we're talking about here, right? And also, if you think about the processes, um, you know that it comes from an animal, right? It comes from uh, the teat of an animal, right? Um, so you're like, oh, wow, what, is, what does this have to do with anything? This is ripped from the headlines, okay? This example is actually something that's playing out as we speak. The additional characteristics that I'm using are the way that the dairy lobby defines what they consider to be the product of their work, milk. Now you may think, well, of course, because that's what milk is. That's the essence of milk. That's the essence of this dairy product. But hold on for a second. What about almond milk? What about milk made from quinoa? What about milk made from um, all these other plant-based items? Isn't that milk too? Doesn't it have that same projected hidden essence? Not according to the dairy lobby, because almonds, they can't produce milk. Sure, they have natural ingredients, but not the same natural ingredients and nutrients that come from a cow, right? They don't come from a teat. As one um, dairy farmer says, I've never seen almond milk come from a teat before. I know this all sounds super weird, but this is playing out as we speak because what's at stake is a social role for people for whom this identifier, this identity is central. We're talking about a way of life. We're talking about money. We're talking about the things that give people a sense of identity. It's who they are at their root, at their core. Now, as we've used Martin's model of projected hidden essence, right? There's a milkness that exists in the world, Plato might say. We, use, we, we can begin to see how the way that, that the label dairy is deployed, right? Dairy is used by the milk lobby as well as the federal, um, the, few, the Food and Drug Administration to describe certain products, certain characteristics that get applied to some hidden essence. But we know that in society, this milkness is thought of in other ways too. It gets contested, right? Let's, let's take it from the perspective of those um, outside of the dairy lobby, those who are lactose intolerant, who though benefit from milkness in the world, okay? Hang with me. Are you taking notes as I do this? So we've talked about milkness. We're gonna use the same label, but we're gonna watch a different process that people use to make sense of or deploy that milkness, okay? So the projected hidden essence is going to stay milk, right? Projected hidden essences are often argued over, fought over by competing parties. But the same essence is at play. 
milk. But we're going to see different labels attached to it, right? So milk is going to be here. Um, let's, let's call this, uh, as some of these groups say, um, plant-based alternatives to dairy. They say that this is what people substitute for dairy in order to take part in or have milk, right? And the people who are behind this multi-billion dollar industry of plant-based alternatives to dairy, they talk about milk in terms of its function, right? Milk is as milk does and what people do with milk. So what do you do with milk? You pour it on cereal, right? Pour on cereal. You drink it. You bake with it, right? If you can pour it on cereal and you can drink it and you can bake with it, okay? Um, this says bake with it, by the way. I'll just move this over here. If you can do these things, why wouldn't you call it milk? Well, you're like, because it didn't come from a cow. But the people for whom plant-based alternatives to dairy is a big deal would say that it has these characteristics that allow for it to still function as milk. Oops. It functions as milk. It does what people do with milk. It allows you to participate in all the same day-to-day -day rituals that we do. You can cook your favorite recipes. You can have your favorite breakfast. You can have your favorite drink with these plant-based alternatives to dairy. And it makes sense for it to be called milk because whenever someone needs milk, you can substitute it and it gets the job done. Now, of course, the dairy lobby is like, wait, 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 wait. That's not true. But guess what? In some stores today, plant-based alternatives to dairy and milk are in the same section. And there are even stores where there are more plant-based alternatives to dairy than they are actually dairy milks. So what is milk? Craig Martin would say, you've got to deconstruct it to find out. Not just what goes inside the milk, but how milk functions in the world, the worlds in which we inhabit. This goes on, this process of, can be applied to any place where we observe people essentializing. And the world as we know it is full of people essentializing because it's expedient, it's efficient, it helps us make sense of the world. But at what cost? At whose expense? That's the question that the scholar of religion is always been asking. So yes, essentialism is extremely common in our day-to-day -day lives. But as scholars of religion, we have to hold ourselves to the standard of making sense of the people who are doing the essentializing. That's what it means to occupy that edict outsider perspective and doing the work of redescription. So when we deconstruct essentialism, we can learn how it operates in the world around us. Now, one of the key sites where we can watch this happen is when people talk about identity. As I began this video, I said something like, identity is everything. We make a whole bunch of these terms that we use to identify one another and to name and label and claim ourselves, our own personalities, who we are and where we come from and what we do and what we're capable of. Identity so often is everything. But as Martin has shown us, there's so much more that goes into what makes us and what makes others around us. A French philosopher by the name of Jean-Francois Bayard has talked about identity in terms of not a singular quality, but rather a, a form of classification that abbreviates all of the politics where they're in. So just like Martin deconstructs essentialism, he says when it comes to that essential that's known as identity, we need to think of it in terms of operational acts of identification. Jean-Francois Bayard says, when we approach the essential that is identity, we need to deconstruct it and think about it in terms of operational acts of identification. Using that four-part model that Martin uses to make sense of how people are using classification to make sense of themselves 
and others in the world around them, which they have constructed with their words. Identity is not a thing. Identity is a process. And as scholars of religion, our job is to take a look at those processes.